Hey there, folks. I'm Jason Wright. And today I want to bring you a message that I think that a lot of us, we inherently know to be true, but we don't often act on this truth. And that is this. To make life easier, you first got to make it harder. And a lot of people right now, as we've seen in a lot of pop culture, modern society, from our educational system to the workplace, there's this idea that we are never supposed to struggle, that life is never supposed to be hard. It's supposed to always be easy. And if there's anything that makes it hard, then there's some nefarious, oppressing force coming down upon us that must be done away with. We've got to take control of this mindset and remove it and realize that there is joy in pain. There is joy in struggle. There is meaning and purpose in struggle. Now, my hope for each and every one of you that listen to this video, and by the way, if you like this sort of content, please, please, please click like or subscribe. At the time I'm recording this, I think I have 213 subscribers. I want to turn that into 2.13 million, and I need your help. So one, please click like and subscribe. And then two, please leave comments. Let me know what you thought of this video. Feel free to let me know what I can do differently. But most importantly, please keep coming back. I will always do my best to help you have content and give you messages that will help you to improve always and always, which is my motto. So with that said, I hope that you have a joyful and blissful life full of meaning and purpose. I don't want struggle to happen to anyone. I mean, why, that's not something you'd wish upon someone. But at the same time, I do want you to understand the value when those struggles come. So it was Nietzsche that said, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Now we have to ask ourselves this question. Is this a truth or a trope? Is it truth or not? Is it just something that people say to make you feel better whenever you're going through those hard times or not? I am here to make the case that it is absolutely the truth. And you think about over your life. How many times have you gone through pain and struggle and heartache only to come out on the other side with more knowledge, more resilience? You've just proven to yourself if you make it to the other side of whatever the pain, the struggle, the heartache was, whether it's losing a loved one, whether it's a bad breakup, whether it's physical toil, an illness that you've overcome, it's a job that you absolutely hated and despised, but you stuck it out and you made it to the next job with the knowledge of that one, seeing everything you don't ever want to have repeated in your current vocation, and you make life better from the struggle that you once knew. If you look back over the course of your life, if I were to ask you, what was the absolute best day of your life? What is something that you can look back upon and find total elation and pride and exuberance? I can almost guarantee you it has to do with a struggle that you overcame. It's some challenge. You graduated from college. You finished graduate school. You, you finished a marathon for the first time in your life. There's generally always a struggle attached to the most great, the greatest memories of our lives. And so we have to find opportunities to create struggle, to create that resistance so that when life inevitably throws those things at us that may kill us, we're able to absorb the pain that much better because we prepared for it. One of my favorite books is The Art of Learning by Josh Waitzkin. Josh Waitzkin is a grand master chess champion, and he's the subject of the, of the movie, The Search for Bobby Fischer. One of the things that Josh Waitzkin would do whenever he was learning to play chess or whenever he was preparing for tournaments, he would have his instructors kick him under the table. In fact, he played against an opponent that would actually do this during the match. He would create scenarios in which it was just absolutely anything but ideal to play chess. And by doing this, whenever he got into the real chess match, if he happened to be across an opponent that would kick him, he was prepared for it. One of the things he would also do is make sure that he would he would go ahead in those times when he did not want to train, when he did not want to, to play chess, he felt just tired, exhausted, just uninterested. Those were the times that he made sure to absolutely play the game of chess. 
He wanted to make sure that by making life harder, that when it came time to live real life and life would inevitably try to make it not easy on him, he was better prepared. That's what we have to do. And Nietzsche said this when he said, what doesn't kill you does indeed make you stronger. I remember whenever I was on this trip, it was a mission trip to China. We were going through the southern Hunan province of China, and we were in the foothills of the Himalayas. And my buddies and I, we set out on this nine-hour trek, okay? We, it started with a nine-hour drive through some of the most treacherous roads you've ever seen in your life. If you've ever watched uh, World's Most Dangerous Roads, I think it was the, some Discovery Channel show that came on. We went through a lot of those roads. They're so narrow that you know if anyone meets you, there's almost, you can't fathom a way that two cars could pass on this one narrow little road. And it was this little bitty truck. And I'm, over, I'm looking at this overhang that just dropped straight off. And it was the scariest experience of my entire life. And it went on for nine hours. Well, eventually, we get to a washed out bridge. And the, the driver of the truck, he just stops, throws up his hands, and as is to say, well, this is it. And we looked at the bridge and we're like, yep, that's it. Now, there's something else I need to tell you. On the way up, five times we had to stop and push this guy through mud to get him unstuck. And I'll never forget, I thought for years and years and that whole time, like, how in the world did he make it back down? Because after taking us for nine hours up this mountain, he then left us, turned around and drove right back down. And I'm always worried about him going through those mud puddles and everything. And, but anyway, we get out and we were not supposed to leave until the next day. We were supposed to stay in a little hostel in this little village and then get up early the next morning and start our trek up the mountain. It was about two o'clock in the afternoon and we thought we had enough time. You know, we had our GPS and we had our gear and we're thinking, well, there's plenty of sunlight. We knew about how long it would take us to get to the top of the uh the, of the mountain that we were or the the actual summit that we were going for for this uh this trek and we decided to set out a day early we didn't do what we were supposed to do instead we took off and we go up and and we start hiking and there's these little narrow goat trails where that you hike up i mean they are they're not and they're slick with mud it's humid and all of a sudden we noticed that there's these little worm looking bugs st sticking to us well they were little leeches that were attached to these tall thorny bushes that would sting you and they would they would itch because the, they were like little bull needles that's what we have here in Texas or that's what I grew up calling them and so we're getting stung we're going straight up this ridge and one of the things about the Himalayas and that region when you climb up it's not like the Rockies where you can climb for a little while. First of all, you've got marked trails, little signs kind of telling you where you are, what the elevation is. But also there's a ridge at some point. You go up for a little while or there's, and, and you, can, you can hit a, hit, a, hit a ridge and then you kind of, and you can rest and you kind of keep going. That's not the case in the Himalayas. They go one way up, straight up. There were times whenever I could like lean out and touch the mountain and just almost felt like I was crawling up. Well, then something weird happened. In addition to battling the leeches, which we had to stop and pick off every 15 minutes, the bull needles that are sticking us as we go up this little goat trail, we learned that our GPS does not have our waypoints on it. It only has the trek. So that's essentially like having a map with roads, but no cities. And so we had no way of knowing which way we should actually go. Excuse me, I actually said that wrong. Having a GPS, or our GPS, had waypoints, but no treks. So we could see the actual areas where we were supposed to go, but we had lost the actual trek to get there. So we had to guess. There's a problem with that. Whenever you're hiking up in the Himalayas, you're running out of sunlight. There's no water. Our water came from rivers that we would get and we'd scoop out and we'd put uh, tablets in to purify it. And we, we had not had any water since we since we set out. So we're running out of water. We're running out of daylight. We're exhausted. Leeches are covering us. We're getting stuck with these bull needles. And we're hoping that we're taking the right trek. Well, then something else happens. I start dehydrating. And I could tell at this time in my life, I used to sweat profusely. I still sweat pretty bad, but this time I sweat really bad. So I'm like just sweating profusely. And I've got a, oh, did I mention we had 50 pound packs on our back? I mean, everything that we had for a 15 day trip, we carried on our backs. So 
we're making our way up and I'm just starting to get dizzy. I want to pass out, but I can't stop. I have to keep going and going and going. Well, eventually we make it to a place where it's called the shepherd's shack, where it's this little lean-to where we put up our tents and we camp on this little bitty, bitty ledge that's at the top of this mountain. And I remember waking up the next day and feeling like I'd had the flu for like a week. I was completely dehydrated, had no energy, and we still had a long way to go. So we end up, we start going and we turn around and go back, which is really risky because we were on, a, like I said, we were on a mission trip and as Christians, you're not allowed to proselytize in uh, communist China. You, you, you're not allowed to do that. And you also run the risk of if you talk to anybody and let them know what you're doing, then you might get them in trouble. So what we would do is we would take these little discs, or excuse me, these little cassettes that had the, the gospel on them, and we would put them in wood piles and hope that these people on these little bitty farms way up on the sides of mountains would find them. And when they went down to the village for supplies or whatever, that they would then... Um, they would play them and they would hear the gospel. That was the mission. So it was a big risk to turn around and go back, but we had no choice. I couldn't keep going forward to summit and go down the other side of the mountain like we were supposed to. We get down and I, eventually we were back, but we have no ride. We have, and, and by the way, every time we went from point A to point B, we were having to uh, just catch a ride, a boat. I mean, it was really planes, trains, and automobiles. And it was just, you get from one destination to the next and figure out, okay, how do we get to the next place where we're going? And eventually we make our way out and we're going down and, and we're thinking, this is amazing. Fine. We're going to get out of here. We hire a driver that's going to take us the next morning. We meet him and we're going down the mountain. And all of a sudden, after all of this has happened, and I'm sitting here thinking, I thought yesterday I was going to die. I literally ne thought I was never coming off this mountain. Started thinking, why did I do this? I have children at home. I have no business being out here like this. This is ridiculous. Why did I do this? We're going down the mountain. I think, oh my gosh, there's a little bit of relief. And we're in a like a, 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 a Jeep Cherokee, which was like, I mean, luxurious uh, for, to find a little village on the side of a mountain. And we're going down. And all of a sudden, I look up in the road. And there is a truck that is literally across the road. It's blocking the road. And up to my right is the mountain and there's water rushing down the mountain, under the truck, over the road and down the other side of the mountain. And this truck is stuck and it, it can't make the turn to go around. So I'm sitting here and I'm thinking to myself, well, I wonder how we're gonna get out of this. But here was something that was different. I remember at the time, as clear as day, thinking to myself, I know we're going to get through this. I survived the bull needles. I survived the leeches. I survived that just ridiculously hard, heavy, sliding climb. I survived through the night whenever I turned my tent on. I would see the leeches on the tent trying to get in. It was hot. It was humid. I was dehydrated. I would survived all of that. I would survived pushing the guy through the mud. I would survived the, the, the bridges washed out and all these things that and to where all of these things, these inconveniences, these, these hardships along the way made me look at the truck, which, by the way, was filled with 100-pound sack concrete in it, so 100-pound ba bags of sack concrete, as we found out once we went up to the truck. And I looked at it, and I was like, how are we going to get out of this? I don't know, but we're going to. It was the first time I ever thought, oh, okay, this is kind of cool. Now, mind you, I also thought this isn't like Survivor. There are no TV cameras. You don't even see planes fly over. There, there's no telecommunications. There's nothing. You're out. No one knew where I was. I was completely off the grid on the other side of the world. It's one thing to try to go off the grid in the, here in the United States. I was off the grid in Hunan, China. So I'm like, I'm out here. If I die, nobody misses me for a long time. And But I was to the point through, because of these hardships that, hardships that had come before, I was prepared for this one. And eventually what we did was the, the guy that grew up on a farm out in Sulphur Springs, Texas, finally realized that these poor guys that were trying to get the truck unstuck, they would pull rocks and, and mud uh, out from under the truck only to watch water just fill it back in. And so what I did is I asked, is there a jack in this truck? And sure enough, there was. So I jacked the truck up or we jacked the truck up 
stuffed rocks under there to get just enough traction to eventually, and we dug out the side of the mountain to where the truck could eventually make the turn, and we left. We got through it, and I knew we would. And even that has added to my catalog of making life harder so that it can then be easier. Now, I didn't ask for any of that, but it was a short training session of all those subsequent things that life had done to me to make it harder that made that final battle of getting that truck out a little easier. And so what we have to do is we have to find those things that can test ourselves, put yourself in uncomfortable situations, make life harder so that it can then be easier. Who hasn't heard of Jocko Willink? One of the toughest human beings, scariest human beings, greatest warriors on earth. Jocko, whenever faced with difficulty, with th whenever faced with anything bad that's a hardship, an inconvenience, as a warrior, and to this day, he says this, when things are going bad, don't get all bummed out, don't get started, just look at the issue and say, good. As Jocko says, that's my Jocko impersonation, good. And why does he say good? It's because here's what Jocko knows. He knows there's going to be something to be learned in that moment. He knows that he's going to be better coming out of the hardship than he was going into it. He knows that harder makes easier. And that's what we have to do. Don't get caught up in this, this ridiculous idea that life is meant to be easy. Life is not meant to be easy. Life is meant to be challenging. Life is meant to be a non-ending education. And so as you and I endeavor, to improve ourselves always and always. Don't be afraid of the pain. Don't be afraid of the hurt. Because let me tell you something. No one, make it to the point where no one or no thing can be as hard on you as you are yourself. That's what I'm trying to do. I try, I want to, I remember the biggest thing that I regretted, or I wasn't, I didn't regret, but I was kind of saddened by after I came back from that trip I described to you is I thought, how will I ever feel this again? I'm not going to simulate that. I'm not going to put myself in a, in a life or death situation purposely like I was in. And so I thought, how will I ever be able to regain this amazing experience that I've just had? And I've never experienced anything like it again. But I tell you this, that experience has given me something to draw upon when life unexpectedly becomes hard and difficult. So simulate. It's just like weight training. You break your muscles down, you make it hard so that then lifting heavy objects gets easier. It's the exact same principle. If you want to live a happier, more joyful life, an easier life, Whenever the hardships come, say good, like Jocko, say good, because that's when you're about to be tested. That's when you're about to learn what doesn't kill you will, in fact, make you stronger. So until we meet again, keep on improving always and always, even if it means having to make life just a little harder. I'm out.